sometimes I just don't know what I've shared with you before and what I have. And this is one of those stories. I don't know if I've ever shared this story with you. I, I just know that it's a story that it took a very long time for my sister to share with my mom and dad. Um, it, had, it was a story we shared, no doubt, when we were in our 20s, and we had you know, had some distance between being naughty teenagers. And we are in an Italian wrestling dump in Memphis, Tennessee, Grisani's, and it was a place we used to gather. And I guess my sister had had one too many glasses of wine or something. <laughs> because she started telling the stuff that we all knew about, but mom and dad didn't know about. <laughs> and the story she shared was about a time when we were teenagers, and she was an older teenager, three years older, and she and her friend uh, were going up to a dance in Como, Mississippi, and my friend, we had driver's license, but we were, that was a little bit far to drive, so mom said, Cindy, you and Deb are gonna have to take your brothers to go to this dance. And she loudly protested. I mean, she really poured it on. She argued and argued, said, I won't be seen with, with my brother, and then Debbie won't be seen with her brother going up to, I don't think there are dates. <laughs> God help us. So uh, we won, got to go, we got in the back seat. My sister turned around and gave me a look I have not seen before or since, a fierce look, a fierce look that was in her eyes. And she looked at me and she said, if you say one word to mom or dad about what's about to happen, I will kill you. <laughs> and my first thought was, oh, great. I'm going to have dirt on her that will never come off. And she said, what happened was that uh, Early, the previous week, they had sneaked up to Memphis, up Highway 55, and bought themselves a bottle of Boone's Farm wine. <laughs> and they had hid it out in a field outside, just outside of town, the direction we were going. And we drove to that place, it's now a big subdivision, and went out there, that soggy old sandy gravel road, and pulled over. She went out to get that bottle of wine. She got back in the car and they were giddy and laughing. And then she hit the gas. That car, zzzz. The more she spun the wheels, the deeper it got. It was down, down to the floorboard of the car. There was mud scooping out everywhere. And she was like, what are we going to do? Fortunately, there's a gas station about half a mile away. We walked up to the gas station. And there was just a guy there, a young teenager. It was, you know, the service station had closed. And he said, my daddy ain't here, and he can't, he can't, I can't get the record, go out and help you, but you good people right now, he was a teenage boy, and, and he said, I, he, I said, well, can't you take it, my sister said, he said, well, I'm not supposed to take the record out by myself, and my sister batted her lungs, she's a very beautiful woman, and, and she batted her eyes and started to cry a few tears, and he goes, okay, I, I'll give it a try, and it's not too far from here, took down hooked up the wrecker, and then he, he gets stuck. <laughs> and to get out, he has to, the only way he can figure to get out is to go this direction, which is out towards the bean field. And he keeps getting stuck and getting unstuck. Pretty soon, he's in the middle of the bean field. <laughs> and our car is still stuck. And some high school football players ride by, and they say, oh, that's no problem. We'll go, go get our friends. They had about 12 football players pull out the car for my sister. It's the Lecter 225, big old car. And we drove up and had a great time. But before we left, I looked out in the field, and there is that poor teenager. He's out there in the field, and he's going to have to tell his daddy what he did. And he's in deep, way deeper than we are, because we go clean the car up at the end of it. Nothing's ever said to mom and dad. Right? But you know what it means to get in really deep? And one thing leads to another. You know what they say, when you, when you get into a hole, what do you do? Stop digging. And my sister's just laughing. And they say, they wave goodbye to that poor kid. And now this is a rather shallow illustration of, of the story of what happened to David. It doesn't have anything to compare with what happened to David. My goodness, what happened to David? 
I read this story, and I've read it so many times, and coldness fills my heart. The same coldness I feel when I listen to the news story or read something in the paper about some ungodly, an awful thing that some human being has done to someone else. I think, how in God's green earth can someone do that? It's so horrendous. I hear about David and what he does. I think, here he was Earlier, we've looked at two stories before this where he's dancing around the ark, praising God out of a pure heart of praise for God. And then later on, he's, he feels so gracious at everything God has given him that he has the audacity to, to suggest, I'll build you a house, God. That same David has done something awful. You know that the, the hint as to what happened and what got him into trouble, it's in the text itself. You know what it says? It says, when it was springtime, a time when kings do what? The kings go out to battle. David sent out his general, Joab, and all of Israel to fight the Ammonites. And then it says explicitly, David stayed home. He stayed home. What's happened to David? Too comfortable, everyone. He's king. He can do whatever he wants. He's in charge of his own castle, his own place. It's his kingdom. He can do what he wants now. And you know what happens when you get bored? You ever have kids when you get bored? What happens? Trouble happens, right? They, they, they beg you constantly or sometimes trouble happens. And you know you got to watch them when they're bored. And when they're really quiet, you really got to watch them. And that's what happened. Looked out the window. He's castle must have been up high and he's looking down the courtyards of other houses of, of some of the people who were special in his kingdom and he looks down and sees in the back of a house he sees Bathsheba and she's got nothing on she's gorgeous probably any guy would have been tempted she's gorgeous and the Bible one scholar says what he does is he saw he sent she came, they laid, without one struggle of conscience. Now, the story has often been presented as if Bathsheba had something to do with this. Read the text. Where does that come from? Me Too movement's been a good thing because it's woke us up about some of the things we do and we, how we blame victims for what happens. If you read the text, Bathsheba did nothing. And at best, David was in a position of power and authority that put her in a very awkward position where she probably couldn't feel like she could refuse. And at worst, she may have refused and he could have taken advantage of her, raped her. So don't try to clear David up by sanitizing the text. And David takes advantage of her, and then later on, he gets a message back from Bathsheba sent to him, said, I'm pregnant. It's the first time Bathsheba is given voice in the whole story. He says, I'm pregnant. And you can imagine the, the sense of sheer terror and fear that came over David when that happened, just to, to know, what is he going to do now? He's in the hole. Is he going to dig? He digs. Says, ah. I'll get her husband to come home from battle, and maybe if he lays down with his wife, she'll think it's him that got her pregnant, and it's not my child. You know who Uri, Uri is a, what? Is he an Israelite, a good practicing Jew? No, he's a Hittite, a foreign mercenary who must have been some accomplice that he lived near the king. Mercenary, not even a, a faithful Jew. And he says, no, I won't go lay down with my wife. My troops are in the field. They're out there suffering and living hard, and many of them are giving your lives. While I'm here in comfort, I won't take advantage of that as long as they are hurting. Is David thinking about his kingdom when he did what he did? Does he give a thought about the well-being of anyone else in this story? No, he doesn't. He even gets him drunk the next night, and he still doesn't go do it. It's a contrast between the two. Who's the better person? The man of God? Or this foreigner? The foreigner. 
And then David comes up with the most wicked thing that he could have possibly done. He said to his general, send him a note saying, send him, send it back in his hands. And he didn't even open or read because he's not supposed to. Sends it back to Joab, and Joab sends Uriah and his men to the front line and draw back where they know they will be killed, and they are killed. Wow. And the end of the story, of course, is that the prophet Nathan comes and confronts him. And a beautiful, a beautiful story he uses to confront him with, and David has deeply repents, and God forgives him, surprisingly forgives him, but David has to live with the consequences that there will be violence in his house. And then you read the rest of David's saga, it's filled with violence in, the, in his house. He pays a terrible price that never ends. A natural consequence to what he has done takes place in his house. Now, I sometimes wonder how do, how do people get into this message? And I look at David, we got these wonderful stories that we've looked at, two stories of of positive examples from David. Now we get this incredibly painful negative story, the most negative one we have in Scripture of any of the leaders of God. And we have something to learn from it. And I think the first thing when I look at the story that I learn from it is how David is a man who teaches us the importance of remembering those around us. You and I are connected to everyone around us. And when something happens and we do something, and we do something good or we fail to do something good or we do something bad, it has repercussions for everyone connected to us. We are called to live a life, awareness of how what I do affects other people in our lives. We're not free just to go do whatever we want because we feel like we can do what we want. It's my life. I can do what I want. Now, I remember... Uh, we, we, we're a church that believes in social justice. We, we talk a lot about social justice, and it's very important that we do that. I remember hearing, I told you this story before, a professor down in, uh, a retired Southern Baptist pastor down at Stetson College. I talked to him at a seminar I went to, and he's a magnificent human being. He said, you know, one of the things I, 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 I've, I've come to think, and he's talking about politics, he says, you know, if you never vote against your own self-interest, politically speaking, it's time for you to analyze your political attitudes and your Christian. Time for you to analyze your your, your Christianity. And I think that's true. We are people dedicated for working for justice in the world, and we have to take into account how social policy affects people—not just us, but people beyond us—and even be willing to make sacrifice. And that's the social justice message I have from this. But I want to tell you, we as social justice people who care about these issues sometimes forget that there is also a personal gospel that's just this, the same thing and how our own individual personal sins and actions can affect and break down and cause major pain in other people's lives that we are held account for that that we are called to be true for that to recognize that how I act affects people around me in ways that I may not even have any idea of the repercussions I may think I can do this or not do that and, and just doesn't affect anyone. It's my business anyway. I know someone who um, uh, years ago, he was evolving in his career, doing really well in his career. He was rising up as someone who could represent the company, and they were sending him overseas to the biggest clients, sometimes talking billions of dollars. They sent him overseas down to, down to the Middle East where he was going to deal with this country about their investments and So much money was at stake, and he closed the deal. They put him up in a beautiful hotel. Beautiful hotel. I mean, you can't, you know, it's elaborate. Everything was so nice, and he was going to be in that hotel, and he came along, and he wanted to celebrate. He's lonely, and he travels all the time, and it's lonely to travel all the time. There's tensions in the family. Why? Because, well, he's not around when the kids need him, and, and his wife needs him, and there's some resentment's going on. He feels underappreciated. He's thinking, here I am. I've this great achievement. I've done it all for my family. And I don't get anything back. He's sitting in a hotel. I'll celebrate by myself. There's a beautiful woman there. Just gorgeous. I don't know what her story is. Pretty soon, they're up in her room. And it gets around. 
Because he's got a team of people there. You don't think people saw that? And he get back, gets back to his family. And you know what happens? Hell happens. For his family, they divorce. And for those kids, the breakup. And they, they loved each other. But boy, this just broke them. And you live with that. But that's the nature of not considering our actions on other people. We have no idea the repercussions. Even in the Bible, God forgives him, but he still has to live with the repercussions of the kind of human being he has been. God can't erase that. There are natural consequences to what we do in our lives. And to think about what we do. But there's another dimension to this that goes even deeper. And that is that David forgot about God. He forgets. He forgets about God and who God is. All the goodness that God has done for him, all that God has blessed him. And uh, one time he had the sense he knew that it was not him. He knew that the gifts were from God, that he was born from God. He was given God. He was called by God. He was empowered by God. His life was a gift from God. And he had such thanksgiving. Somehow over the years, his mind has drifted. He is no longer, he's come to think this is about me. This is my life. This is what I built. And God has seemingly very little to do with it. And that's true for us. Think about your lives, the gift of your life. You ask for nothing to get to even be born in this world. You've received it. Life, birth itself is this huge windfall and gift of life. God has sustained you. God has called you. You have been baptized, baptized into the body of Christ. And our baptism means that we are baptized into Christ, that our lives no longer belong to us. They belong to God. And then God gives us a call, all of us a call. Do you know you're called? You're called by God. Even if you're retired, you're called. Even if you say, I'm a stay-at-home mom or stay-at-home dad, do you know you're called? Not everyone realizes that. We think just pastors are called. I was having a conversation a long time ago with, uh, a while back with, with, with uh, a person who I just discovered is going into politics. Going into politics. I said, now what would make you want to go into politics? That's a, <laughs> that's a, a tough spiritual context in which to live, by the way. And a tough life in many ways. If all the power and the trappings, but it's, there's real huge downsides. And he says, well, you're a pastor, and I know I, I'm, I'm not really called or anything officially called, like pastors are called, but I, I, the only way I can describe it, it's like a call. I said, oh, no, you are called. I was so pleased to hear him say it, that he felt called by God. I was so pleased to hear him say it, because it was genuine. I could tell. I said, you're called. We all have a calling. And, you know, if you're a doctor, what are you called? What is the virtue you live for, you live under, that, that guides you? Wholeness and wellness. We're always a flight attendant. What's a flight attendant called by? Well, most people think just hospitality. Well, that's part of the call, but the larger call is security. If you're a business person providing goods and services, what is the larger call providing? The larger call is providing uh, human material need and want. That's a high call. Every one of you, if you're a mom, what's your calling? It's the highest calling. Or if you're a dad, or you're, you're stay at home, what's your highest calling? It's love. To be loving human beings. What can be a higher calling than that? To remember God is to remember that we are baptized. We are forgiven, loved, beloved, and given. And we are called. And we're called to go forth into this world to live and give God. Now, God knows that David forgot. Forgot about his connections, forgot about God, and God forgave him. And God forgives us. God forgives us the times our memories go, and sometimes we still live with the consequences. But God forgives us and restores us, as David was eventually forgiven and restored to God. You know, one last thing. One day, your life's going past, you're going to be gone. You'll be in this church or you'll be some church and someone will be sharing and they'll be standing up and talking about the good things that they knew you did in your work, the good things you did with your family and with your church and your community and the difference you've made in people's lives. 
But I have a question for you to ask before you get to that place. The question is this. Do you have integrity in your life? Do you have integrity in the way you live your life? Are you true to what God has called you to be? Are you true to being the person God has made you to be? Because that's the thing that matters. Are we being true to our higher self, to that great calling, that great gift that God has given to us? And if we're not, God forgives. Turn around. Turn towards the light of Christ and follow in his way, both in our social life, our sense of justice in the world, but also in our personal life. Give ourselves fully to Christ.